So, a long time ago, in a galaxy not so far away, in fact, it was this one, I found myself standing in a physics laboratory. For a while in my life, this happened quite a lot on account of studying physics. So this laboratory was probably as exactly as you might imagine. From floor to ceiling, it was stacked with monitors, screens, buttons, switches. And at almost exactly the height of my hand from the floor, there was a big red button. And above it, there was a sign which said, do not press. In fact, it did say, do not press, in three different languages, which just goes to show how important it was. So I recall seeing the big red button and the sign, and then the next thing I remember is that I'd pressed it. <laughs> what happened next is also exactly as you might imagine. The room actually made this noise. <laughs> the screens went black. After a bit, they started flashing. And so I did the grown-up thing, which was to walk away quite fast. <laughs> but not so fast that anyone would notice and think that something was up. So people like me could give curiosity a bad press. Pun intended. That took a little while, come on. <laughs> They say that curiosity killed the cat. Well, Curiosity doesn't kill cats. I'm here to kick that very unhelpful <laughs> proverb right out of the cat flap. Curiosity gives us nine lives. And why am I telling you this? Well, because our relationship with curiosity really matters. I think that we are at a tipping point in the timeline of human knowledge and what we choose to do with it. We urgently need to reclaim curiosity for the 21st century if we're not just going to survive, but thrive. So I've got three famous cats to introduce three types of curiosity to you. Each one will give you three bonus lives, and then we'll get back to the red button later. So, first up, first famous cat is Nian Cat. <laughs> The original YouTube video, if you haven't seen it, has been watched over 151 million times. I have personally joyfully contributed to at least one of those hits, if not more. So back in 1989, a guy called Tim Berners-Lee, yet to be a sir, was really busy inventing the World Wide Web, and he was doing it to share the vast amounts of data that was being generated at CERN, the big particle physics experiment, doing incredible curiosity-led research into the fundamental nature of matter in the universe. So little could he have known back then that in the future, billions of people would be using his brilliant invention to mostly share videos of cats. <laughs> cats in boxes, cats playing keyboards. We've all got our favorite internet cat, right? So Nian Cat represents, for me, sort of it sums up all internet cats, but also represents our first type of curiosity, a trait that we've all had since childhood. It's called diversive curiosity. And that gets defined as a sort of a wide-ranging, but potentially, um, potentially superficial or transient attraction to the novel, to anything new, especially, I suppose, to an animated cat made of a Pop-Tart with a rainbow coming out of its bum. <laughs> Now, there's nothing wrong with diversive curiosity. Research suggests, in fact, that when you're in that state, you're more open to approaching ambiguous images and information. And we're in this digital age because we've got this incredible connection to more knowledge than we've ever had before. It's become almost unremarkable, hasn't it, to have the entire accumulated knowledge of humankind literally at our fingertips. And for 2.6 billion smartphone users, literally in our pockets. And I just wonder if that instant, constant delivery of informational nourishment means that we're starting to value it less, that we're losing our capacity for developing a longer-term type of curiosity. Because If you think about it, the top two search terms in the world last year were Pokemon Go and iPhone 7. 
according to Google Trends, they were the things we searched for as a planet last year. So our internet curiosity has gone so meta, it's kind of imploded, hasn't it? As a planet, we chose to search for a thing on which you can access the internet in order to download a game that only works because internet. We've become curious consumers, that's for sure. But we have this incredible opportunity at this point in time to do something really extraordinary together. We are more connected and we have more of a global perspective available to us than any generation before. So how do we make the most of that potential democracy of ideas available to us? And how do we enable more people to become not just curious consumers, but curious creators and change makers as well? Well, we have to remember what it was like to be about four or five years old. Peak question asking age. And we have to practice asking questions again. We have to get really good at it, because it is the most powerful tool that we have at our disposal. We all have it. Each question is a stepping stone through a bog of fake news, political disarray, and nonsense. But it's not easy, right? Because we've been conditioned since kids that hands go up in class to answer, not to ask. And you need courage to enter the uncertain space that asking questions actually opens up to us. Which brings me to our second famous cat, and it belongs to the mind of Erwin Schrödinger. So, Schrödinger's cat experiment. You get a cat, you put it in a box. In the box is a flask of radioactive liquid that has a 50-50 chance of decaying, of releasing some radiation that might kill the cat. So until you open the box to observe what state the cat is in, to see how it's getting on, in the world of quantum mechanics, it actually exists in what is known as a superposition of states. The cat is both dead and alive at the same time. Now, admittedly, this is probably the only example where curiosity could kill the cat. <laughs> but it is a thought experiment, so I'm not going to let it count for that. So, if in trying to think about this experiment and quantum mechanics, your brain feels a little bit like it's trying to grasp hold of a slippery soap in the bath, well, don't worry, you're not alone, because the uncertain nature of it is very counterintuitive to us. And that's why I think we all struggle a little bit to hold on to our curiosity after childhood. It's uncertainty. And interestingly, our brains have actually evolved to resolve their way out of uncertainty as quick as they can. I learned this when I was creator of impossible projects at a public perception laboratory run by the neuroscientist Bo Lotto. And in fact, you can watch his own TED talk where he uses visual illusions to reveal how the brain deals with uncertainty. Now, Bristol is actually home to a famous visual illusion. Um, it's called the Café Wall Illusion. You can go and see it in a set of tiles on a cafe on St. Michael's Hill. Um, it was discovered by Professor Richard Gregory. Um, so if you have a look at this illusion, and you have a look at these tiles, it looks like the rows are a bit wonky, right? You probably wouldn't get this builder back to do that again. Um, if I change just one thing about this image, which is the color of the lines between the rows, you find that they are, in fact, parallel. So this just goes to show how far the brain goes to try and resolve its way out of uncertainty. It actually constructs realities for us based on our past experiences and making assumptions about what it thinks we're viewing the conditions under. So when you look at a visual illusion like this, it sort of makes you feel a bit curious but also a bit uneasy. It just doesn't feel comfortable to not know in life, does it? But there is a bit of a solution, because curiosity has been described rather beautifully, I think, as the knowledge emotion. And it's odd, really, that there is a desire with acquiring knowledge, a kind of a wanting to find stuff out. But perhaps that has evolved for a reason, because curiosity motivates us to go into the unknown. It allows us to imagine possibilities beyond our current situation. And our modern lives would be unrecognizable without the humans before us pursuing another type of curiosity, epistemic curiosity. So this is a longer-term knowledge and experience generating curiosity. And they've done it with courage and passion, asking questions like, how fast can I run? What would happen if I traveled on a beam of light? Why must paintings be realistic? Without epistemic curiosity, there would be no smartphones or internet or gin or roads or electric guitars, cubism, penicillin. The greatest thinkers and innovators 
across history asked questions. They broke the rules. They didn't accept the status quo. They smashed paradigms of thought. I would like to imagine that Einstein would have really enjoyed Nian Cat. But then he'd have been asking, well, hold on, what happens if I travel on a rainbow beam of Pop-Tart Cat through the universe? That would have been a hell of a theory of relativity. Life is uncertain, but there is a positively disruptive energy that we can find in that space. What happens if we take the best of our digital world and the way that it can connect us in play and in communication, and we combine that with asking questions together? Because the combination is powerful, right? The more curious you are, the more you can step into the unknown. And the more time that you're prepared to be in an uncertain space, to play and dwell there, the more curious connections you can make. It's a curious circle. Which brings me to our third and final famous cat. It's a big cat. It's the Lion King. All right, I cheated because I just wanted to get to the Circle of Life lyrics. There's more to see than can ever be seen, more to do than can ever be done. Now, all right, it might be cheesy, but for me, this kind of sums up what it is to be alive and the potential that we all have to write whatever it is that we want to write on our page of the human story. Which brings me to our last type of curiosity, empathic curiosity, an interest in the feelings and the needs and the wants and the well-being of other human beings. Because what really bugs the hell out of me is that we still do not all have an equal start in life to fulfill our potential. It is naive to suggest that if we all just became curious, then we could solve all political and social and economic problems. Of course, it's not as simple as that. And with uncertain futures as well as uncertain present times, for far too many of us, curiosity, curiosity has become a luxury that we just can't afford. But what if, what would our destination look like if more people could be part of that curious conversation? If everyone could participate in perceiving new futures together? So we know that we learn better when we're curious because it's connected to dopamine, which is the reward chemical in our brains that also affects our memories. Because actually you do need to know just a little before you can get curious. You need to, something to chew on. But even if you are lucky enough to be one of the world's educated children, you are more likely to be fed textbooks at school than a hunger to learn. We're still teaching our kids to regurgitate facts and pass exams. This belongs to the Victorian era. Our system is woefully inadequate. It's not fit for purpose. We don't even know what we are educating our children to go and do next. We don't know what jobs they're in, what the world will look like. What we need them to be is agile connectors of ideas, comfortable with not knowing, but with the tools to find out. What we really need to do, the best thing we can do, is teach them to be all kinds of curious empathic included. Despite more access to knowledge than any generation before us, we still face big un unanswered questions. What are we going to do about climate change? What do we do about our growing and aging population? How do we house them? What if a superbug takes over? These are so-called wicked problems, problems that are so complex they are not going to be fixed by one person sitting in a lab and having a eureka moment on their own. We need connected, diverse minds and curious people more than ever. People who connect ideas across disciplines. So all of my best adventures have started with curiosity, not with any particular experience or talent or anything like that, and that's how I ended up working with animators and dancers, opera singers, scientists. What we don't really need is the type of curiosity that led me to press the big red button. I pressed the big red button because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, my curious adventures have also led me to be uh, connecting up with some other curious cats, and that is how we have now evolved a science centre into We the Curious, which is a place and an idea dedicated to cultivating a culture of curiosity and empowering everybody to ask questions. And this final big red button is here to remind us all that we tend to put up imaginary and totally unnecessary do-not-press signs in our minds when we are faced with the unknown. 
when we are uncertain, when we're not being curious enough. And if later today you experience what I do after watching TED Talks, which is a glorious combination of being both enormously inspired, but also feeling very slightly inadequate. <laughs> it's not just me, OK. Um, you don't need to do the last bit. That's the good news. Because you and me and all of the speakers that you're going to hear today, and actually everybody on planet Earth, shares the same vital common trait, and that is curiosity. I am simply here to remind you and encourage you to be curious, because it's our time to do something with it. If the 21st century so far has taught us anything, is that we can no longer sit around while our leaders flap about. We need to get doing stuff. We need to be asking questions. This century is only going to take flight with the power of connected, creative, curious citizens. So if your curiosity is a bit dormant, wake it up, find it. Start a practice of asking a question and exploring it every week. You can take Leonardo da Vinci as your hero. He used to write to-do lists every day in his notebooks, probably as long as I am tall, and they would have things in it like, find out what a woodpecker's tongue looks like. <laughs> Measure Milan. Imagine doing that without the internet. <laughs> if you're already curious, fantastic. Don't stop. Go deeper. Keep asking questions. And take time to notice whose questions aren't being heard and see if you can amplify them. If you're thinking about any of those things, then we're going to be in a better state. This is a time for curious activists to get together. A society of curious people is going to be more creative, more compassionate, more resilient. It's where we want to be. It's time for a new age of curiosity, and it's time for you to press your imaginary big red button. Thank you.